Hello, good day for all of you all. First of all, let me wish every one of you a very success exam, the management case study of November 2020. Now SEMA has officially released the case study. It's a company called Cryblox, and it's a company that is involved in the manufacture of plastic bricks, mainly for toys and educational purposes globally. I mean, they are, they are uh, selling in almost 110 countries. So I'm Kuma, I'm Learn with Kuma, and I have done a little bit of a pre-scene analysis in slide forms, which I want to share with you all. And if you all have any questions, I'll give you my telephone number and email at the end of the last slide. You can uh, ask any questions. If you all have anything, I will be very much pleased to help you all with the, uh, with the PC analysis and the case study. Right, so it's a listed company. So that means we know that they have to fall in line with corporate governance, IFRSs, IESs, and they'll be regulated by the stock exchange. It's in a country called Waranda, a developed economy. So developed economy means generally the wage rates are high. People can afford the disposable incomes are fairly high. So that's the kind of a country that is the price box fits links uh, uh, there. It was incorporated in 2004 and listed in 2010. The founder directors have uh, retired or gone out of business once it was listed. So now it's a, a company that has been managed by a CEO and uh, four executive directors. There are four non-executive directors and a non-executive chairman. So now they have become the world's second largest manufacturer of construction toys, ranking behind the leading brand. So we know all these are fictitious countries, fictitious companies, but we can generally get an idea who is the leader in this plastic brick toys for educational purposes. And here we are number two company. The examiner has been always been mentioning that we don't need to worry about the true companies or try to analyze the what is this real company kind of thing. If you can get some details, do it, but you don't need to worry. And the examiner has told us very clearly, we don't need to memorize the precinct. So this is why I have done these slides and uh, this recording, which will help you uh, to get some idea of the precinct all the time. So it's a listed company and uh, uh, good corporate governance, internal controls, all those things will be there because it is a listed company. There are one factory in Waranda, this country. There are one large distribution center in the factory location itself. And there are six overseas, sorry, seven overseas distribution centers because they are exporting or operating or rather they are selling their products over 110 countries. So it's a fairly a big company. 2019, we have been given the financial statements as a 31st December 2019 consolidated financial statements for the year in the 31st December 2019. So you need to be mindful that by the time we come to your November 2020 exams, these accounts are, these financial statements are 11, 11 months old. Almost you are on the verge of preparing 31st December 2020 financial state. So please hold on and see whether there are any new developments given in the unseen, because this was a difficult year for all of us, for every business uh, with the COVID-19. Uh, there may be certain areas, particularly branded toys like tri blocks. Uh, people, their disposable income would have got reduced and maybe they would have got fairly impacted with the COVID-19. However, last year, 2019, 3.6 billion V dollar revenue. So we do not know V dollar is how much equivalent to US dollars, etc. Don't worry, but it's a big company because whatever it is, it is dealing with a billion. So I have summarized these figures for you all. It is as of 31st December 2019, 110 countries, uh, although we are in business for, from 2004 onwards, 
the industry is 90 years old 90 years old the, the main competitor when he started it was in 1930 and after that there have been many others who have started the business but as of 2020 we are number two company just behind the number one right so the product range so basically they have the product range as that of our number one manufacturer number one player in the industry the basic tri box basically which the the blocks which goes into the uh, three years to teens kind of thing and mostly used for educational purposes by schools then the advanced version is what is called tri box kits which is sort of uh, you know it's a uh, you produce one thing, maybe a maybe a, a, a Buckingham Palace or something like a, a train or something like that with all the parts and all that. You might even not want to dismantle it. It's like a, once you do it, you will want to keep it. But the basic ones you will dismantle, produce a new new kind of a model, all kinds of things for the kids to play about. Then we have the character kits, which is becoming popular with these characters like Harry Potter and all that kind of thing. Uh, now there are those things, they need to get so-called licensing from the intellectual people who owns those things, the movie characters, you know, this uh, Captain America and whatever, I don't know. So uh, then they had to pay a royalty and also they had to get approval before they put those characters uh, into the market. Uh, Although we are number two of a company, Tribox, so remember I'm talking my company, our company, because you're part of the company. You are the finance manager, one of the finance managers inside the company, it's a big company. So they might have many managed financial managers, I do not know, but you are, because they say you are a financial manager. So they match the quality of number one company. So high quality products, they produce high quality product. So the organization structure, there are four executive directors in charge of one for finance, one production, one for marketing, and the other one for HR. And there's a CEO on top. So uh, under finance, there are three divisions. I think IT, finance, and management accounting. They, are, they mostly work responsibility center basis as cost centers, except the marketing director is having some um, uh, centers which works as revenue centers. So product managers, there are, uh, there are number of product managers for each product range because they are the people who will be really marketing the product, promoting the product. So they will give the feedback to the uh, design department. Design department is also under the marketing director and there's a production director. So design department will have to coordinate with the marketing director and uh, liaise, the product managers will liaise with retail customers and conduct market research, etc. So it's a fairly old industry. We are comparatively new, but we have grown very fast to become the number two player in the industry. Uh, design is under marketing director, production is under production director, but there need to be a lot of coordination because there'll be a lot of, lot of uh, constraints in the production and uh, there may be certain needs of the design. So they need to come to some compromises and some kind of uh, workable, practical arrangement. So you, now this is, sorry, this is the business model, right? So this is very important because we know the, we are there to create value. And generally, it was all this time, it was believed the value comes from one capital called financial capital. But now we know it's not only totally the financial capital we require, we require intellectual capital, we require human capital, we require natural capital, there are manufactured capital, there are many other capitals that is needed. And that's why in your F2 paper, now they have introduced something called integrated reporting, which will be taken in the F3 again, but you need to know a little bit about integrated reporting. So we, the businesses are there to create value. So first of all, you have to define the value. So this is the business model. 
the, on this only you will work out. Your mission will be based on the business model. So they are there to meet the challenging needs of the children. So basically your market is children for entertaining and education. Children, they will play with these toys and get themselves entertained. And also, uh, so yesterday we celebrated World Children's Day and uh, 2nd of October, we are now having this pre scene in our hand. How do they create value? They create value by selling familiar product that can grow with children. From the age of three until their early teens, I've seen even sometimes children uh, going about teens also, they like this to play with these private, uh, these sorry, plastic uh, bricks kind of thing. So uh, only sympathetic changes and developments will be considered. Whatever that the child thinks is needed will be considered. That's how they create value. How do they deliver the value? They deliver the value by creating a product that can be understood and enjoyed by the children of all cultures, regardless of nationality. So you can't have your products in English, or you can't have your products in Chinese language, or you can't have your product in any particular language. So how do they take these uh, cultural barriers away? They put up everything in pictorial forms. No language instructions in pictorial form. So any culture, whether you're from Bangladesh, whether you're from China, whether you're from India, Sri Lanka, UK, anywhere, they can look at that pictorial form. That's how they define and they deliver the value. And how do they capture the residual value? So they work in an efficient manner in order to offer high quality products. So remember the balance scorecard, internal business perspectives must be very, very strong. And they pay realistic wages, which enable the staff to support themselves and their families. So they give a lot of consideration in the business model for the employee. So uh, they have about 150 designing staff working because the designs are very important. And also they have uh, overseas staff working in those distribution centers in maybe seven countries. The people will be working and uh, uh, they have not given us the number of employees, but must be quite a large amount because they do have a HR director at the very top. And in this country, uh, you remember it's a developed country, so the wages are fairly high. Uh, so you have one, what we call minimum wages that need to be paid. And in this country, in Varanda, there's something what they call living wages, living wages, which is sort of, you know, uh, uh, more than the minimum wages, which will keep the people sufficiently well sufficiently well. I mean, it's something they, they look forward to. And our company, uh, Flybox, Flybox, is committed to pay that living wages, not the minimum wages, living wages. So we can see they are very, very focused on their employees. So these are the matters that we should look at in our case study, people management, one of your E2 subjects, you know, those things will be very important. We have to keep our employees happy and their staff, their families also happy because we need quality product because we are matching the quality of the number one producer. So you are the finance, you are a financial manager at head office. This is how it is defined. And there's the senior finance manager, Alex, who is reporting to the finance director. So you are in the third hierarchy, finance director, senior finance manager, and you as the finance manager. So finance division has a couple of functions. One is the management accounting, which comes under your purview. There may be another finance manager looking after financial reporting, and there may be another person who is looking after the IT, maybe IT manager. Now, if you look at the SIMA blueprint, it says that we are we have to communicate, external and internal, we need to communicate. So your support will be sought by IT person, your support will be sought by your FR, financial reporting person, and also even in the other department. Because you are a SIMA person, you have a good knowledge and people will look forward to you. So remember, you know, there are five core values in the 
in the SIMA blueprint, which you need to have it. So I'm putting up another video just after this on the role of the finance manager of uh, uh, this uh, ply blocks, uh, ply, uh, ply uh, blocks. And if you uh, if you have time, go to that one also. If you are happy with this uh, presentation, please just put subscribe in the YouTube channel, which will uh, help you to get more information, more details. Because I will be uh, during this next one or two seven weeks i'll be putting up many many uh, videos many mocks for you to study uh, for your management case study exam so they do have a chart director one of the executive directors is the chart director they have 150 design staff they must be having bigger staff but design staff is a core staff 150 so this is what i call living wages which is much which is above the minimum wages and company is committed to pay the living wage or more. Because the pre-scene says at least, at least. Overseas employees, you know, when they are working overseas, they had to be looked after their accommodation, if families have gone, children's education, all that. And uh, particularly nowadays with this COVID-19, some of these people, they may want to come back. So providing air travel, providing quarantine facilities, uh, you know, cost of quarantine, all that is something that the company will have to bear. So, because we have the financial statements as at 2019, and by the time we sit for the exam, it will be 2020, almost towards the finalization of 31st December 2020. So, you will have fairly a task to complete uh, things like uh, uh, things like uh, uh, provisions to be made. So IES 37 will become very, very relevant for this case study, I believe. Customer network. All sales are to third parties. So they don't sell anything directly to any customer. So it's a business to business model, B2B model. We don't sell directly. We don't have an outlet to sell directly. And we are selling our products in 110 countries, basically, online retailers, local and global, significant portion of our sales is happening to online retailers, both in our country and in, in the global area. We need to keep good relationships. So building up relationships is very important. So remember the ecosystem in your E2, which will be a good topic for you to manage for this case study. Then we have catalog retailers. They are basically, they do have catalogs with these all our products. Customer will come and they will look at those catalogs with the children mostly and they will order and sometimes they might collect it straight away on a physical basis or they might order online and get you to deliver. So catalog retailers. Then we have this major toy chains. Now that is a business that is sort of shrinking. Now, most of the people are going for online because the children also now they know how to work through the telephone, laptop, get the online uh, catalogs and to decide rather than going to a toy chain, a shop. Uh, particularly with the COVID-19, people will not want to go. And uh, so that portion of the sales is already struggling and I think it will struggle for more. But what they say is, in most of their countries, at least they have one retailer or rather one shop, but they sell through physical a major toy uh, shop. Then they generally give these things at bulk quantities with a bulk discount to these people. So you have a minimum quantity to buy. So whenever some companies, some businesses, small businesses, they may not be able to buy those minimum quantities. So what these wholesalers do is they buy that quantity, enjoy the bulk discount, and they will resell to the retailers, again, keeping a margin for them. So this is how this business is happening. And uh, later on, you will realize uh, when you look at the financials, they have a huge GP margin, 72% or something, a huge GP margin. This company is enjoying. So we have given details. We are not given details of the number one, but we are given details of we are number two and another company, number the number three company. 
almost both the companies have same details which I have analyzed and I put it up in a slide, I think which will be very useful for all of you all. So your customers, basically children, from three years upwards, the children. Uh, we, number one company and number two company, basically we are focusing on three year onwards up to teen. The third company is even doing some big building blocks, big plastic blocks for even children below three years for which we have not really moved in. Schools, because they use it for educational purposes. Schools, so schools still buy it. Adult collectors, now this is a fantastic one. Some people, they just, as a hobby, they will buy some of these large kind of kit packs. They will put up a, you know, maybe a palace kind of a thing, and they will keep it like that. My granddaughter is just about 12 years, but she has got a big uh, set and she has done a sort of a, a building like a Buckingham Palace and it's just there. She doesn't want to dismantle it even. Collector's items. Then there are adult users. In the precinct, they say some people use this plastic box to get the chassis of a printer. So at a low cost, you can do the chassis and use those whatever the the mechanical parts and get a good printer done. Why not? And engineers are using it for prototypes. Now these are the five markets that they, the, the customer network or the people who are buying these products. So uh, engineers prototypes, again we can see the third, uh, company, the third company is focused on that area. Uh, they are producing two product ranges which we are not producing. One is the children below three years, and then for these engineers, we do, but they do it in a much larger scale. So pricing policy. The pricing policy is not based on cost, because you can see 72% margin, right? So that means the cost is not the factor. What they do is they look at the main competitor. Recognizing he's the main person, recognizing his um, kind of uh, uh, reputation, the brand image, we price it just about 5 to 10% lower. 5 to 10% lower. So pricing is based on added value, perceived added value. For example, you might have 100 pieces, which is costing you something. Just because it's 200 pieces, it's not going to cost you double the amount. Right, like, right, like that. And you might have a little added, added value-added component, which will cost you $1, but because of that value-added component, the price of the product may go up by $5, kind of thing. Pricing is said to get a margin even after giving quantity discounts. So even after giving quantity discounts, you can see our company, GP margin for last year is 72%. And the number three company, our competitor, K Constrong, 71%. Almost same figures. And when you analyze deeply, you can see almost same figures. So what you can see is at the moment, the, both the companies have, for their revenue wise, they are just about 50% of our, but both the companies have almost the same kind of a model working through. So if you want to do something beyond this, we have to think of how are we going to manage our resources more efficiently. So I think activity-based costing will be an area for you to think about. The company, Triblox, recommends a retail price, but because of the competition regulatory mechanism, they can't enforce the recommended price. So retailers can sell at a higher than the recommended price, Recommend the retailers can sell at a lower than the recommended price. Now that can have certain implications because in certain areas, the, some of the retailers might want to sell it at very high prices because they want to get a good margin. And therefore, mm. the, you might see uh, your sales dropping because if we are almost near to the market leader, then the people will buy the market leader spread out, right? Because we are, we are same quality. But still, that perception of market leader will be there because they have been in business for much more longer period and they must be having a good customer network. 
the idea of Tribox and all the others is to creep into the market. And, you know, when the children are playing with the main competitor's product, they can easily substitute our product also because the patent rights are not there. The time for the patent rights are expired because this is a 90 year old industry now. So they, the main competitor, main part manufacturer has no patent, right? So we can manufacture the same kind of block, same colors. So long as we don't abuse the business usage. I mean, we don't try to put a name similar to their name or a logo similar to their name, a logo to mislead the public, we have no problem. So that's it, we can do it. Competition. So there is a little chart they have given us. We can see, I think they have given it for about five years. We can see number one company, uh, 5.2 billion revenue. Number one company, their revenue is 5.2 billion. So they given information from 2004, yeah. Up to 15 years, they have given information. And you can see they have had a they've had a very steady growth and they have peaked up somewhere around about 2017 and they have come down in 2018 and now again they are picking up. Whereas we, Tribox, we are 3.6 billion, so just about two-thirds of their revenue we are doing. Again, a very steady growth, but now it's becoming slightly flat, not totally flat, slightly flat. The growth is just about 4% if I remember right. Then see Constro, they are just about one uh, of half of our revenue and they have again have grown up up to 2018 and now it's becoming a little bit flat like. So that's what we need to know the, the way it is. So the all together the market between these three companies 5.2, 3.6, 8.8 .8, and 1.6 about 10.4 billion. So we can say 50% of the market is of the three competitors, 50% of the market is with the main number one. And we are holding about 33% and the other company is holding about 17%. Okay, so the manufacturing process is very much automated, uh, but remember SEMA is focused on digitalization. So I'm thinking of digital workforce in E2, robotic operations can come up because these are somewhat repetitive kind of products. Just take the raw material, uh, the, mace, the, most, uh, the main raw material is this plastic called ABB, and uh, you have to melt it at high temperature and pour it into the molds. That's what the process is all about. There are molds with finite life period, and it's costing about 50,000 V dollars, and it can do about 1 million impression. So uh, that's what it is done. And there are other plastics also being used uh, in this product. So mass scale production. Now this is very important because when you take a mold, you want to use as much as possible uh, that product. So there are different sizes, four by two and all that kind of thing. They will try to produce as much. So, uh, one thing that you can be uh, you can imagine is that inventory will get built up inventory will get built up because you're going to produce say for example uh, a cap or a hat or something like that you will keep on producing that one till that mold will sort of can produce it because you don't want to change many a times because the setup times and all that could be very costly so that's why i say Activity-based costing is a good uh, scheme to introduce. So they have not told anything, but I think they will ask us in one of the variants about implications of introducing activity-based costing. Why? Because we have to manage our resources very efficiently. And one of the tools we can use is activity-based costing. Right? So main raw material is that one, and other plastics are used. Mass scale production, automated process, even packaging is very much automated. Your product cost, basically cost of bricks, the plastic bricks, which you take that raw material, melt it and put it into the mold and do it. Packing is very expensive, you can understand. Children are the people who are buying it. They look at those colors in the boxes. So the packing is very, very expensive. 
distribution expensive because they are distributing over 110 countries uh, with seven distribution centers outside our country and one in our country uh, because it is more more of space the weights are very little so they have to do it on most the space is going to take a lot of uh, freight charges etc because the freight is paid on the basis of not on the weight but on the basis of space so therefore your cost of exporting will be fairly high and also when we use those characters we have to pay those intellectual people the the, the people who owns those intellectual property royalty payments at the time of manufacture so it's a manufacturing cost it's not a selling and distribution cost it's a royalty payment is a manufacturing cost so remember these things very very important for you to remember inventory management is so important mass scale production of components so what they do is they will produce a particular component and once that component is over they will stop producing that one quietly they will not make too much of noise saying that we are going to stop the production if they feel that the demand is not coming they will stop once that particular hat or cap or flower whatever when that goes off of course if there's a demand they will continue to reproduce inventory days i have worked it out from the financials it's about 92 days and you can see our competitor also for the end of 31st december 2019 92 days there are certain inventories which are there which they may not use it the product is abandoned so they can repurpose it so some of the wheels they produce for a bus they might want to put it to a van or something like that otherwise what they will do is they will melt it down because this is abb means a very hard plastic they can melt it down and they can bring it into the production process again so products are introduced and withdrawn quietly they don't make such a noise of introducing products or removing the products from the market so basically it's the children who will be looking for these products through the catalog and they will come to know through many sources about the product and they will want the parents to buy the product so financials as i said you have to remember it's the 31st december 2019 financial statement and 2020 is a very difficult year for any business and by the time we come to november 2020 we should be thinking in terms of preparing 31st december 2020 financial statements also so is 34 talks about interior financial statements so being a listed company maybe in march in june and in September, they would have issued interior financial statement. And probably they might give a little bit of information about the last 10 or 11 months, the trend of the company. Almost all the companies have gone through a difficult period. And particularly a company like toy manufacturing might have a difficulty. But remember, they are coming to December. December is always Christmas time. There may be good uh, uh, market for toys at that moment of time with COVID-19 hopefully receding. So that's also you have to look at. Uh, you can see they have a foreign currency reserve. So foreign currency reserve means, that means they have foreign transactions and foreign subsidiaries, I would say. Foreign subsidiaries. IES 21 says, whenever we have foreign subsidiaries, those assets and liabilities including the goodwill should be retranslated and any gains or losses should be to the other components of equity and that's what you see in the statement of financial position but there's a little bit of a mystery for me goodwill remains same both years so obviously they have not acquired any subsidiaries during the year because the goodwill is a big figure 897 million big figure and it's goodwill comes under IFRS tree through the acquisition of subsidiaries. So probably they would have a strategy of acquisition, but last year, between 18 and 19, they may not have acquired anything. But I'm at a loss to understand uh, with the foreign translation, how the goodwill remains same. 
because generally with the foreign currency translation, goodwill also should move, right? Because of the goodwill also need to be retranslated under IS21. So I can come to two conclusions. One conclusion is the foreign subsidiary goodwill is already impaired. And therefore, there was no retranslation of goodwill happening uh, between 18 and 19 because goodwill need to be uh, tested for impairment. And if there is no goodwill, then therefore there is no retranslation. That's one assumption that I can think of. Second assumption is that the foreign subsidiaries, they bought it without paying any excess consideration over the fair value of net asset. Right? So uh, that's why. So you can see there is uh, 897 plus 45 intangible assets. So goodwill is a big one and it constitutes almost 30% of your total asset. So you can see they have paid certain money and acquired some good uh, subsidiaries, paying excess consideration of the fair value of net assets. And that's how they have one third of, that's almost a one third of intangible assets. No indication of uh, non-controlling interest in equity. That means almost all the subsidiaries are fully owned subsidiaries, 100%. But that does not mean that that will be the story for 2020. They might say, because with the COVID-19, lot of businesses are available for sale. They might buy another new acquire acquisition, provided they have money. They might go for a new acquisition, which might have an uncontrolling interest. So you need to learn about IFRS 10, how to treat non-controlling interest in the financial state. Surely, IS 21, foreign exchange translations will be tested. So just keep a note of that part. And also we need to be mindful, 2020 is a COVID year. So post COVID scenarios also need to be looked at. So I'm going to put up some videos later on. Wait for it and you will have some of those videos coming up. So I've worked out some of the ratios for y'all. Uh, revenue growth in our company, it's about 3.9%. In C Constro, it's about 3.5. So you can see the revenue is almost sort of come to a uh, saturated limit, right? The growth earlier, the growth had been very good, but now you can see it's almost settling down. GP margins, you can see very, very high. Both the companies, 72 for us this year, last year 71, but other companies 71 and 69. So you can see how much value has been added to this business. Your raw material costs are very low. Raw material costs are low. And if you look at the payable days also, you can see they are enjoying, both the companies are enjoying a fair amount of payable days. 115 days, 124 days. So we are getting a lot of credit from our suppliers. So I worked out on certain numbers just to get an idea. Operating margin, 33, 32, 29, again, almost there. Dividend payout. Now here, I'm taking a different view because what happens is when you look at 31st December 2019 statement of changes in equity, you see a dividend payout. Now my thinking is that cannot be out of profit of 31st December 2019. Because 31st December 2019 financial statements are finalized somewhere around about February 2020, uh, uh, February 2020, right? So you can't pay a dividend out of 31st December 2019 profit. So my thinking is the dividend in 19 is paid out of 18 profits, 18 profits. The profit of 19 profit, they will pay a dividend in 2020, one year later. So that's how I have worked out. You can see dividend payout ratio is 94%. 94%. Our last year income was 792 and we have paid a dividend of 744 million. And even the competitor has paid 83%. So these are high dividend paying companies. What do you think? High dividend paying means they have, they are, they, they are investment needs are met. They don't need to retain a lot of fund. They can afford to now pay high dividend. So if you are a shareholder, or if you are investing in this company, you would expect high dividend. 
Now the problem is with COVID-19, will they be able to will they be able to sustain that kind of a high dividend? Because all the companies are going through cash flow problem. Inventory days. Again, you can see both the companies have 92, 92. Receivable days. Both the companies have 68, 66. So you can see almost there's a kind of a trend, a kind of a thing. But if you look at the revenue, we are just 3.6 billion. They are 1.5 billion or 1.592 billion. Almost half. But you can see industry has some kind of a standard. And the gearing, we can see both the companies have paid some debt during the year. And if you look at the statement of financial position, current liability, non-current liabilities, there is some amount in, uh, in our company, Priblox, 31st December 2019, uh, current liabilities, they do have, yeah, 31st December 2019, they do have 900 million. Last year, at the end of year, they had 1,000 million. So they are repaid 100 million, most likely. But we can't see any under current liabilities, any loan repayment. So that means most likely they don't have to repay anything during 2020, which is a good thing. Because 2020 will be a very difficult year. Because if there was any kind of payment that they had to make during the year, that will appear under current liability. You as a finance manager should be mindful of debt covenants, if at all. Look at for those things in the unseen. And in that case, you may have to think of what are we going to do in the present scenario? Should we go and talk to the bank manager? Make certain adjustments, all that. So the tools what we use at this moment of time, we need to look at how to work out the cash flow and see how realistic our cash forecast. We need to look at a couple of scenarios we are not very sure when the COVID-19 will be over. So we need to work out a couple of scenarios. And also we need to uh, uh, have a good business plan done with our new strategies, etc. Present these things to our lenders and financiers and get. Stock market is very dull these days. So uh, unless you are a very, very strong, you should not be recommending of a share issue kind of a thing but things like convertible bonds are becoming very, very popular. So later on, I'm going to put up some more videos on these areas. Keep watching for these things. Subscribe for this channel and you will have a lot of access to many information. My website is www.learnwithkumar.com. You will have all these things uploaded there. And my YouTube channel is Learn With Kumar. And my Facebook page is Learn With Kumar. And also, uh, you will have uh, all this information available uh, to many of you. And my email is premakuma55 at gmail.com. If you all need any clarification, just send me an email. I'll try to reply you all. And uh, my telephone number, already give, it's given in the slides, plus 9477-321-9387. I offer online tuition at very affordable rates. And if you all need any online tuition on management case study subjects or strategic case study subjects or F2, P2, E2, any of those areas, F1, P1, E1, F3, P3, E3, contact me and I'll be very much uh, prepared to help you all through online, through Suma, through Zoom. And uh, I've been doing this for last 17 years and last 13 years, sorry. And a lot of students have uh, passed with me and they are now CFOs, finance directors all over the, the, the business world. Okay. Other issues. If you look at the last three pages of the pre-scene, there are a lot of other issues they are talking about. 11 year child is talking about packing. Why are they putting it in this plastic bag? She's concerned about the environment. So you can see the increasing importance of environmental consideration. The company has given some kind of explanation. That's all right, but we need to be mindful. We need to be environmentally friendly. Trend is towards online sales. As I said, the people are looking, they 
most likely with this COVID-19, particularly, people will not be traveling to many countries. So everything uh, will be mostly on online catalog kind of sales. So your websites, all those things, you don't sell directly. You are not selling directly, but probably you might want to, you must be having a website to for your retailers to contact you and, and to get it, the sales done. And also, uh, you, you need to be mindful, the social media is very powerful tool. So maybe, uh, even though it's business to business, you might want to do some advertising, marketing in those media. There's uh, uh, this collector's item, uh, one particular item where they kept, where the, you know, the grandparents bought it to give it to the grandchild, but then it was not given because the parents have bought the same thing and they kept it and later on at an auction, they may managed to get a big, big money. So maybe we will produce certain items as collector's items and which we can sell it at a premium price. Market may be smaller, but still it's a market for us to cater. And engineering kits, our competitor is very much in this area and the, the, most of our engineers are using, using these things for prototypes and this is a market which we can gather. So our research department will have a lot of work to do in these areas to get uh, this business. So these are the issues that I have uh, done on this area. So once again, good luck to all of you. I'm Kuma from Learn with Kuma. And my telephone numbers are there. My email is there. My website is there. If you are happy, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Learn with Kuma. And Facebook also, it's Learn with Kuma. And you will have many, many of the videos coming up in the next couple of days. My next video will be about exam tips and exam techniques. Wait for it. And that also should be available. And hopefully, all of y'all will benefit out of this thing. If you all need any support, very affordable rates, I will provide you one-to-one -one Zoom classes. And recordings will be provided, and uh, slides will be provided, mock exams will be done, and your questions, your answers will be reviewed and corrected. So once again, thank you for hearing me, and uh, wait for many more videos in the days to come. God bless all of you.